My name's Tom. I'm one of the elders of the church here. And uh, for the last few weeks, we have been doing a series entitled Love Canterbury, which has really been about us aligning our hearts as a people with God's heart for this mighty, wonderful city. Who here loves Canterbury? We all do. It's a great place. Or one of the, if you live in one of the villages or towns around Canterbury, I'm sure you love those just as much. But you get the point. Is that God has been aligning our hearts as a church with his heart for mission to the people around us. That is communicating the gospel, that's the good news of Jesus Christ to the world around us. And we've been various, looking at various topics in the last few weeks. We've been looking at single in the city. We've been looking at partnering the city last week. We've been looking at uh, cash in the city and a lot of different subjects that we've, we've got to put on our hearts. But with each of these topics, the point has been the same, is that we would look at them and we would say, Lord, how do we as a as, as the church use this subject as a springboard to communicate something about Jesus Christ to the city around us? And so today we're going to be uh, we're going to be looking at the subject of sex. I remember a few months ago when we as an eldership were thinking uh, about what good topics would be good to do. I remember at the time thinking, oh, this would be a really good one. Just make sure I delegate it out to someone else to do. And then, uh, and, and somehow, though, blunderous, I ended up doing it myself. So there you go. But today we're going to be looking at the issue of sex, which obviously is a huge, huge topic of conversation in the world in which we live. But the Bible tells us to be a people who are equipped and are ready, in season and out season, to give a defence for our belief. And so today, what I want us to do really, and my aim is very simple, is that we would leave those doors in a few minutes' time with a spiritual toolkit so that we are enabled and equipped as a people when sex comes up in conversation, not to go, oh, or to get all freaked out, but actually, no, no, to have a biblical mindset and to be equipped with three key tools that we're going to get from Scripture today that I believe will empower us and equip us to be a people that can show the people of this city actually God loves them, and that even with the issue of sex, actually God wants to communicate something of his great love for them. So my toolkit consists of three tools today. Number one, two things to conceive. Say two things to conceive. Very good. And then number two, the second tool is going to be one big thing to celebrate. Say one big thing to celebrate. One big thing to celebrate. Wonderful. And then thirdly, one thing to contend. Fantastic. Shall we pray? Then let's get stuck in. Father, we love you. We thank you for your wonderful presence. Lord, we thank you, even in this last 45 minutes, how, Lord, you've just been so obviously talking to us. The smile of the Father. Lord, that you're not a God who comes to condemn. You're a God of grace and mercy. That you are incredibly holy. And that you are also incredibly loving. And God, today, we just say, Lord, won't you be with us now? In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Right up at the beginning, I want you to notice the order of these three tools. Something to conceive, that means something to admit. Then something to celebrate. And then thirdly, and only thirdly, something to contend. Something to, to be strong and firm on. And the reason is that we're looking at those three in those order is because this is, this is something that I just want us not to miss. Is that we as a church are not here... Look, when we think about sex or in fact any subject we've been looking at, to win an argument. Okay, that's, that's not what we're about. We're here to win an argument. We are here to win people. We are here out of love, not to wag a finger, but actually to wash them feet. We're here to, to be clear and not to kind of compromise in terms of what we think about things, but at the same time our heart attitude needs to be one of humility and grace. Because as a, a wonderful pastor from America, Jack Deere, famously said, he said, you can win an argument and lose the people. You can be right and actually lose the people that you're intending to communicate with. So we want today to look at this from an attitude of humility, although also, of course, being very clear in terms of what God thinks. Okay, so let's get to work. First of all then, a couple of things to concede. I think that there are, I just want to say one thing by the way is that this talk um, has been heavily influenced by a talk a guy called P.J. Smythe 
from uh, Johannesburg in South Africa. So I just want to give him credit. Much of what you're going to hear today has been coming from him. There's lots of Tommy Shaw in there as well, but there's huge chunks of it that, that he's preached recently. So I encourage you, if you're you know, hungry for more on this subject, go to their website, it's called godfirst.za, and uh, you'll find some fantastic preachers there. So anyway, a couple of things, first of all, to concede. Blind spots, I think, the church in the last 2,000 years has had. Number one, I think it's fair to say, the church has been a little prudish. A little bit prudish when it comes to the whole issue of sex. I see a lot of you nodding immediately. What am I saying there? I'm saying this. I think we have to just admit and humbly admit the fact that actually the world generally has been more open and more, more quick to talk about sex than the, than the church. And some of you may go absolutely right. Totally. But actually, the point is this, is that if we, as God's people, we actually we weaken ourselves if we don't communicate about the good stuff that the Bible has to say about sex. If we only are known as finger waggers, then the problem is, is that actually we are not communicating the whole breadth the Bible has to say about the positive thing that sex is. You know, the church can appear irrelevant because we make ourselves irrelevant. If we never are those that communicate about this subject, then actually we will be seen, and I think often are seen, as somewhat irrelevant when it comes to subjects like this. Because we never actually are proactive in coming to the table of discussion with talking about positive things, rather than just known as the people who hate abortion, for example. Which, of course, are not condoning it, so it's absolutely a, a, an awful thing. But then God wants today, I believe, to put in us a breadth, a breadth of understanding about sex. Not something to be ashamed of, not something that's all kind of, you know, oh, how embarrassing, but actually something that God's made, and actually wonderfully, as we're going to see, can be used to communicate to him. You know, the fact is that the church has been a place where we have not been talking about the things that the biology teacher talks about to kids that are young. You know, and so we appear by silence to be often condemning something, you know? The biology teacher will say such words as boys have penises and girls have other things. <laughs> See, I can't even say it! And your body language is speaking volumes. I think we've got some work to do today. It's true though, isn't it? We just go, oh Tom, don't say that word. Don't say the other word, whatever you do. But in yet high schools all across this land, people talk about it as if it's a normal part of life. We have some work to do. We have to be prudish. So we must ask ourselves the question, where and where has this prudishness come from? Is it biblical? Or is it actually from somewhere else? And I think there's two key places historically this prudishness has come into the church. Number one, the, the sad fact is, is that very early on in the early church, even the first century, is that many of the early Christian churches actually got themselves involved in a horrendous sexual immorality. I mean, the book of Corinthians, particularly Corinthians 1, but both of them deal with this full on. And if you haven't read those books, I would encourage you to. They are pretty shocking. Some of the things that were happening in the early church were awful in terms of rampant sexual immorality. And so, those Christians who weren't engaged with it quite understandably looked at those who were like, Oh my goodness, sex is obviously an awful thing, and they overcompensated. And actually clumsily, therefore, said, well, sex is obviously even and awful, and we're going to have nothing to do with it. Rather than actually realising that sex in itself isn't, but that actually it was being abused, and was something that actually was being distorted. So first of all, just a bad track record at the beginning of the early church history meant that often Christians whose intentions were good, unfortunately, therefore, viewed sex as a sinful thing. But secondly, the other root of why the Christian church generally has been very prudish about sexual, sexual uh, sex uh, is the fact that, I'm trying to talk about it normally, is the fact that, is the fact, is that actually many of the Christian communities were surrounded by a Greek mentality. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this, is that the Greeks generally viewed the physical 
and the spiritual as very separate. And this is the point, is that the spiritual in Greek mindset was the important thing. It was the really super duper aspects of life. The physical was just, yeah, didn't matter, it was unimportant. The classic picture that summarised this was of a dove being in a cage. The dove was the spirit encaged in the evils of the physical world. And only upon death would the spirit be finally free. This was a totally, totally unbiblical mindset. The Jewish mindset was that spirit and physical were both gifts from God. They were both equal, they were both expressions of God. God was made as spirit, yes, but he also made as physical. Did you know that the Jews, my dad told me this, that Jews had a specific prayer that they prayed when they went to the toilet and it was a successful visit? And they would have a specific prayer to say, thank you, Lord. I don't want to take that for granted. Now, to us, we think, that's weird. <laughs> but because, in their mindset, the physical was just as much a gift from God, it's not weird at all. We're physical people, we celebrate our physical health. Now, this is significant for us, because I think we can often go, yeah, yeah, we see those silly Greeks, what wallets. And actually, unconsciously, we've got a bit of a big mindset as Christians sometimes. We have, we often think the real important things are life of the Spirit, and the physical, well, you know, it's not that important. Actually, it is important. And that's, you see, why this has infected our understanding of sex, often throughout the ages. And so some hilarious examples of this. Some very famous early Christians have said the following. Tertullian, who was an early Christian in the 2nd century AD, said he was said to prefer extinction of the human race rather than continued sexual intercourse. Oregon, in the 2nd century, was so convinced of the evils of sexual pleasure, he not only allegorised the Song of Songs, but he also took a knife and castrated himself. Oh, Oregon. <laughs> Jerome, 4th century AD, he was so against sex and he so thought it was an evil thing, he often would be known to hurl himself into thorny brambles to overwhelm himself with pain when he began to desire a woman sexually. Oh, Jerome. We're growing some of our which is outside, for those of you who are struggling. And Thomas Aquinas taught that sex was only permissible for purposes of procreation. So you see, these are, I mean, they may, may, may not mean huge, huge amounts to you guys, but these were big players in the early church. And they viewed sex as an evil thing. And so we have often inherited something of a prudishness about it without even realising it. Now I want to say, first of all, that we have to concede that I think the world generally actually has been more open about talking about sex than we have. So, for example, in uh, the October edition of The Times, I read recently that sex education now is now going to be, in 2010, a compulsory part not only of secondary schools, but of primary schools as well. Now, they did, they did define what they're going to be talking about at different ages, and I think actually it seems uh, much more you know, appropriate than when you first glanced at it. But they said, for example, that for five and six-year-olds, they will be talking about their body parts. Actually, in a way that means that it's not all kind of weird and creepy, but actually going to be talking to our children, if we have children who are young, about these things. And so this is the thing we have to understand, is that they're going to be in schools where they're going to be hearing about something, and friends, we as a church need to get their books. We need to be a people who actually, if we're parents, or even if we're just involved with young kids, Actually, we need to be a people who are helping them to understand that this is a key part of life. We have to be a people who I think, particularly with our children, talk to them in a way that actually helps them to understand God's view of this, rather than it's just something, this creepy thing they hear about on the, in the schoolyard. I remember growing up, actually, and, uh, and I remember at a young age, my mum and dad, appropriately, talking about sex. I mean, they are wonderful Christian people. And it wasn't weird or creepy. But, well, they did a little bit. But no, they wasn't really. But they were absolutely fantastic. They said, me and mum, we love each other. And there's this thing called sex within marriage. And actually, it's fantastic. And it's brilliant. And one day when you're married, God willing, then it will be something that you can enjoy as well. I remember sitting in a bath at a very young age, and somehow the topic came up. Well, I think my mum was talking about where I came from. And she was explaining this thing, and I'm like, so, you know, what is it, what, what, what is this thing? She's like, struggling to kind of obviously explain what it was, but she was saying, you know, it's, it's a gift from God, and it, it makes marriages a happy place, and it's 
It's a way of coming together and, and being really connected to two people. And it's very pleasurable. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? And she was like, well, you know, when you have a really great meal, for example, you know, oh, lovely. It's not just about the function of the meal, it's about enjoying the pasta or whatever. We have a beautiful wine, you know. God doesn't just make it a functional thing, they said, enjoy it. I was like, cool, great. PJ Smythe, he often talks about the fact that he's got three boys, I think nine, seven, and four. And he will often, he will often talk to them about this. So that it's, it's something that mum and dad have talked to them about first. And then he'll talk to them about it, and he'll say, you know, then he'll always link it to marriage. So if he does talk about it, he'll always link to marriage. And then he'll often say, that, hey guys, let's pray for your future spouses right now, because you know, God knows who they are. Let's pray for them now. And they're like, okay, let's go play cricket, come on that. But for that, but PJ models something brilliant. And he makes a point which is very helpful. He says it's not just about giving them the right knowledge, it's about creating the right atmosphere. I think that's profound. It's not just about talking about it, it's actually creating the right atmosphere so that our kids are actually under, they have a filter. This is the key thing, they have a filter. So that when they're at school, actually they already had an understanding of the right contact with sex. And it's not this weird, dirty thing, but it's actually something brilliant that in the right timing, in the right way. And so we're called as a people, I think, first of all, to realise, to conceive we have been foolish. But I, I just, I would just say, I think uh, it's easier said than done. I was, um, a few months ago, chatting with Josie, and it came up that um, the young Daisy, I've got a two-year-old and an eight-month-old uh, called Lily, and, uh, and Daisy had seen Daddy coming out of the shower, and had therefore been asking some questions, shall we say, about Daddy. So Josie was like, yeah, what do I do? And so, inspired by other couples who are older than us and, uh, you know, spiritual examples to us, Josie began to explain, you know, boys have willies and girls don't, okay? Okay. Step one, we're getting there. And I was like, you did what? You talked to her? She's only two. Does she really need to know about this? And, and, you know, so anyway, so we, we, we've done that and, you know, trying to be, trying to practice what we preach. And then we go on holiday to a lovely part of Norfolk, in fact, thank you, Martin and Sylvia, to a place called Burnham Over Estate, which I would contend is the poshest village in the world. It's absolutely incredible. Everyone's like, good morning, good morning. You know, you find yourself talking differently in this place. It's amazing. Like, Hello, sir. And anyway, I take Daisy out to a beautiful little park opposite um, the cottage we're staying in. There's one other family there on this deserted play park, and I'm like, morning, and they're like, morning, and they've got a couple of little kids, and they're kind of playing together. All is silent in the lonely stage, all is civilized. Suddenly, the top of her voice, Willie! <laughs> oh no! And then again, Willie! Daisy is learning the new word, and she's practicing it. I leap into action, I'm so sorry. The amazing thing was, they didn't even bat an eyelid. They didn't even bat an eyelid. But there was me with my prudish roots being exposed, absolutely crippled with embarrassment. It got even worse. A few hours later, we went to the big Tesco's in Fagan. There we are. Daisy wanders down the beat on. Top of her voice, Willie! Very embarrassing. But once again, no one even bat an eyelid. The reality is this, is that actually, genuinely, as a, as a people, I'm not saying that we all start screaming now, but I'm just saying that <laughs> we have to realise that we've got one spot. So first of all then, I think the church has been British. I really do. And I think just even realising that, and asking God for grace to help us, but I'm not talking about being coarse or inappropriate. I'm just saying that actually we realise that in some ways the world has been a more open place about it. Secondly though, the second thing to see is that actually we have been, I think, judgmental. Turn in the Bibles, if you've got them, to 1 Corinthians 5. Now, this is the church I mentioned earlier. The church, which unfortunately was demonstrating, as well as love for Jesus, it was demonstrating awful sexual immorality. And the mighty Apostle Paul writes to them because he wants to make a very profound point. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9. I think it should come up on the screen, yeah. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Quite right, you say. 
Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world. I.e., not Christians, people out there who don't share the same belief. All the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. I mean, you couldn't even exist in this world. No, I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or idolatry, reveler, uh, reviler, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with one. And this is verse 12, very important for us. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Now this is pretty huge, I think. Because I, my honest conviction is this, is that often the church can be known more for judging the world at large and what it does more than it's known for the high levels of purity coming out of judgment of ourselves. In fact, I think often the church has been known for the opposite. It's been known as a place where we're weak in terms of challenging each other when there's sexual, sexual immorality amongst the church body, and very quick to be very vocal about what we see to be great evil in terms of sexual encounters and endeavours out there in the world. And this is totally the wrong way round. Paul is saying here, he says it. He says, what? For what have I to do with judging outsiders? God! That's God's job. We're not called to be those that are known as judgmental. And yet that is exactly, tragically, what the church has been known for. Turn in your Bibles to John 8. It's amazing, this was quoted earlier on by someone in the worship. Always a good sign when someone brings a key scripture. This is a very famous passage that, that we learn again about Jesus' lack of judgmental heart, about a woman called adult, adult, adultery. <clears throat> it says, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in their midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him, that they might bring some charge against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard this, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, What? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on sin no more. And this is an amazing, this is God on earth, okay? This is Jesus Christ, the perfect representation of the Father, on earth, under pressure, in a public setting. I mean, just think for a moment the flack that Jesus would have got for what he did. Think of the flack from the religious community that would have said, look, it says, it says in the Old Testament that we should stone her. And yet Jesus here, in a moment of incredible wisdom, he, he says, listen, what he does is he separates the person from the behaviour. He separates the person from the behaviour. He tells her in the end, don't sin anymore. He doesn't condemn her. But what we see here is he doesn't condemn the woman. He loves her. He expresses the heart of love. He wants to win her. He doesn't want to win an argument. He wants to win her. He's ruthless in terms of actually communicating the reality of her sin. And yet there's a packaging here that's so useful and so important for us to understand. Jesus is not judgmental. And yet we as the church can be perceived to be. Again, Luke said, one other example. Now, when, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went back to the Pharisee's house and was reclining at his table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life, that's most likely a prostitute, in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on. So Jesus is with the religious leaders of the day, and a prostitute walks in. She kneels down and starts massaging his feet 
with oil and with her hair. I mean, come on. This would have been super frowned upon by those around him. And yet Jesus, we see here, treats her with great love. And there's no ounce of judgmentalism in his heart. Friends, my passion and my desire is that as we as a church, more and more in these days, start to genuinely connect with the people of this city, my absolute passion and desire will be that there will be people who come into this place who have had very exotic life, shall we say. And yet when they come in, they would never sense even an ounce of judgmentalism. Please say amen. Amen. Our hearts would be, listen, man, there but by the grace of God go I. Who here can throw a stone at condemnation? No one. None of us can. It doesn't mean that we say, oh, your lifestyle's fine. No, no. But this is the key point, is that we are not known for the, for the latter rather than the former. We need to be a people who actually can see both that we have as a church being prudish, but also that we have been judgmental. Do you know, I want to say this, is that I think even just those two first elements of that first tool are so powerful. When we connect with people who aren't Christians, if you're not Christian here today, even you hearing us talking openly and honestly about the church's weaknesses, I hope shows you that actually we can come from a place of humility. But secondly, I want to say the second key tool for us as a people is this, is not just a couple of things to concede, but one big thing to celebrate. Namely, sex itself. The world out there massively, massively is intersex. I think we can fairly, you know, clearly agree with that. You, know, you want to sell a car? You have a woman in a bikini next to it. Well, of course, you know, you want to sell a, a photocopier? Well, you have a, a half naked woman. Yeah, the world is into, is into sex. It thinks sex is an amazing thing. It has a very, very high view of sex. And we can say that, in the broadest possible terms, God, very much also, has a very high view of sex. I mean, the amazing thing is this is that there is an entire book of the Bible about sex and love. It's called the Song of Songs, or the Song of Songs, depending on the translation. There isn't an entire book of the Bible about prayer, or about giving money, or about fasting. But there is a whole book, a whole book, about the importance and wonderful tip that we're going to look at in just a moment, of how to be a wonderful, good lover. It's something that God, God made. And so when, when, when we look at the world and we see that this is probably one of the biggest gods in this world, guys, we have to look, rather than condemning, actually look to find the common ground that there is. This is so important for us as a people, is that we are looking all the time in our lives for the common ground with those who don't share a Christian viewpoint. In Acts chapter 17, when the Apostle Paul entered Athens, it says that his heart was broken because the place was full of idols. But then what we see is this, is that then when he starts to actually engage with the people, it's not that he comes in screaming condemnation and anger, but we see, he says, I can see that you are a very religious people. And in a broad sense, they were. It's just that they weren't actually worshipping the right God. Now you see, what Paul was doing here was this. He was looking for common ground. He was saying, actually, you, in a broad sense, believe in God or gods, and actually, so do I. And that's great, isn't it? There's a common ground there. But I just want to now bring to you, your attention, this Jesus. But his heart was one of wanting to find common ground. And I think we, we can us underestimate the importance and actually the, the huge power of being a people who aren't known for throwing rocks at the world, but are known actually for celebrating sex as much as the world does. I remember um, I became a Christian about 10 years ago, and I remember then going into my second year of university, and some of my non-Christian mates were like, so, you're a Christian. So that means, does that mean that you can only have sex in marriage? And I was like... Yes, it does. And they were like, wah, 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 taking the mickey out of me. I would say, look, I will share your high view of sex. I will share with you the, the fact that in your life it's a very important thing. And I would say also, I think that undoubtedly, I'm sure sex will be a wonderful thing. But I'm going to wait until the day when I'm married. So as far as I could, 
It was finding the common ground rather than saying, I don't understand why you're so into this thing. No, no. Listen, God has given us this gift, but it's the context that's all important. And I also want to say this, is that we mustn't underestimate, if you're a Christian here today, how connecting love and romance and sex and marriage with God, how powerful that is, actually, in terms of communicating the reality of a creator God. This is honestly true. When I was considering being, becoming a Christian, I was an atheist, age 20, and I was thinking about this Christianity thing. I've been to this city church, a bit weird, a few times. So, you know, checked it out. I'd heard about Jesus, and I'd heard about the cross, and about resurrection, and interesting. But the thing, bizarrely, perhaps, but not bizarrely, the thing that actually, for me, again and again, came back to me as the most powerful signpost that there was a creator God was actually love and romance and sex. The fact that men and women, who from one perspective are actually pretty similar, but actually we see ourselves as so different, and that this weird thing called falling in love would happen, and then bizarrely the other person would then fall in love with you, and then at some point you may end up having a kiss, this amazing thing, and then you know, kissing tends to lead to other things and, and this thing called sex would happen and, and that there would be, you know, the right bits and bobs to make it happen and then when it happens, sometimes a baby would be born in the woman's tummy and it would be like the right environment. It'd be amazing that there would be so this space would, you know, would, would happen so that a baby can be born and then the baby would come out and there'd be this like mini person who's like, but you know, and it was just this chain of miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And it sounds we get used to it, but for me it was like, this, this, this cannot be a coincidence. This cannot just be a fluke of you know, cosmic proportions. For me, that, you know, I'm a simple guy. Just those, those chain of events were for me almost the most compelling thing. I mean, the gospel was brilliant. But for me, these things were saying, Tom, there's a designer. This world isn't just a fluke, it isn't just an accident. God has put these things into us. So guys, I want to say that it's important that we as Christians understand this shouldn't be a taboo thing that we never talk about because it's weird and freaky and dirty and you know, there we go. No, no, actually that it can be a wonderful tool to communicate something of our creator God to the world out there. It's something actually we need to celebrate. My dream is that we would be known as a people who are more and more free to join and celebrate with people. Yeah, sex is an amazing thing, an amazing gift from God. So, what have I been saying? I've been saying, first of all, the first key tool is this. As a people, we realise there are a couple of things to humbly admit, a couple of blind spots that the church has had, prudishness and judgmentalism. But then secondly, a second key tool is that God wants us to be a people who are actually proactive in celebrating sex. But then thirdly, and notice only now thirdly, I also want to say finally that the Christian community needs to contend for one thing. And this really, I think, is the heart of it, really, is that the arena for sex is very specific. The appropriate place where it happens is the one thing that we cannot ever be flexible upon in terms of our view from the Bible, and it's marriage. That is a lifelong relationship with a person of the opposite sex. One woman, one man, till death do us part. And this, you see, you see, if we've, when we've engaged with those who are not part of the Christian community, if we've actually been following this line of using our tools in this order, by the time we actually get to talking about something that can be rather countercultural, I think actually we've actually won a lot of hearts because we've been humble, we've been celebrating, but also we get to the point where we say, listen, but what I want to say is this, is that the only safe place for a fire is in a fireplace. And actually the fire of sex is a glorious and powerful thing, but just left completely to run rampant, it will burn a house down. It's got to be in a fireplace. God gives us rules not to be a meanie but actually because he's a loving father i wonder could we show the video i've got a brilliant video i want to just show is that is that going to work okay just one second this is a video 
of an interview between Woody Allen, this is in the late 60s, so the quality is not brilliant, hence getting darker and darker, um, between Woody Allen, a very funny guy, well-known atheist, and interviewing on his talk show, Billy Graham, a very famous Christian. And they're, they're friends, but in, the thing I want you to notice is that they almost brilliantly represent the world's view and God's view. And I just want you to notice, even though Woody Allen is obviously very funny, very, he's a genius of, of, of comic spontaneity and language, look at Billy Graham. And actually, he doesn't say anything flash or complicated, but I think as you look at this guy, you see a model for how we need to be. Firm, but fair. Maybe we could run the, um, the video, that'd be great. Mr. Graham, I read that you don't believe in premarital sexual relations. Is this true? Uh, it's not a matter of what I believe, it's uh, what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that premarital sexual relations are wrong. Yeah, that's funny. To me, that would be like, uh, you know, like driving a car, you know, getting a driver's license without a learner's permit first. Well, let, well let, let's, uh, let's just, uh, let's just uh, see. Now, you know, we have to have rules to live by. And uh, what we're saying is we're going to play a baseball game without any rules. We're going to play a football game without any rules. We're going to live a life without any moral rules. Well, God has laid down certain rules and said, if you want the best of life and you want complete happiness and fulfillment, live by these rules. And one of those rules is that thou shalt not commit immorality. Ah, but wait a minute. But if you're, say you're dating a girl, right? Well, I, uh, I don't intend to date anyone. No, but I mean, let's say... It's you, you. Okay, say I'm dating a girl. And say I'm going to marry her, right? She's, she's begged me to marry her. This was after a while. Or <laughs> what's even more interesting, I'm forced to marry her, is what happens. And now, don't I want to get some inkling of the territory? Well, uh, but you see, all, most psychologists today and most psychiatrists, I think, would agree with the Bible that there are very serious problems involved God didn't say, thou shalt not commit immorality before marriage in order to keep you from having a good time or having yes, fun. Yes, he did. He said, <laughs> no, he, he said that to protect you, to protect you psychologically, to protect, uh, to protect your body, because today venereal disease is at an all-time high in spite of all of our problems, and illegitimacy is at an all-time high in spite of all of our medical science. And all of these things, God said, I want to make you happy, I want to help you, and I've given you some rules to live by, and this is the rule. Well, now, let me ask you a question. What if I marry the girl, then, and then, if I finally do get to investigate her carnally, and it turns out she's an absolute yo-yo? Well, I don't think that'll happen to you. <laughs> it's, it's a strange thing when you watch it, isn't it? Because... He's hilarious, Woody Allen, and he summarizes, I think, the kind of conversations we've all had with people and the kind of human logic that can be applied, which kind of makes sense, but what I think comes through. And obviously in that clip, Billy Graham, although he talks about living by rules, I know any of us here who are Christians would say, ultimately, you know, we don't live by rules, we're living by grace, we're living out of a relationship with God, but his point is still very powerful. And that actually, we, I think, as Christians, can talk about sex in the context of marriage in a way that Billy Graham just modeled. Actually, that we can be a people who, when the world, for example, says, one of the big arguments that Woody Allen kind of touched upon was this, is that surely, you know, playing around before you get married is a harmless thing. It kind of gets out of your system. Actually, we need to be a people who say, no, 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 listen, it isn't harmless, actually. Having sex outside of marriage isn't harmless. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. For whatever you sow, you also will reap. You will reap. And the reality is, as Billy Graham touched upon there, there's a whole load of different ways one reaps negative things if you engage in sexual union before marriage or during marriage with someone else other than your spouse. One of the most heartbreaking things, obviously, in the world at the moment, which takes a Woody Allen type of view, one of the most dramatic consequences is that of unwanted pregnancies. The statistics are unbelievable. I was just looking on, on, online, and in America alone, every year, there's two million, two million abortions. And percentage-wise, about 1% are due to rape, 6% are due to genuine potential health reasons, but 93% 
of those abortions are due to social reasons. I, basically, the kid isn't wanted. So what I think we have to understand is this, and this is a serious thing, is that actually, is that sex does have consequences. And that's why God, in his grace, his desire, his design, is that it should be within the safety of marriage. The world would say, well, Tom, what about sexual compatibility? Again, Woody Allen kind of touched upon that, didn't he? The whole idea of almost taking a car for a test drive, you know, to see whether it's, you know, whether it's the best thing. And the world has such a consumer mentality that sex is put in that category as well. Well, you know, you've got to surely, you know, one partner for life is insane. Surely you've, you've got to see whether you're, you know, you're sexually compatible, whether actually genuinely that person is going to be a good enough lover for you to actually have a whole life with them. The reality is this, the Bible is pretty clear and pretty releasing. Do you know what? It says in essence this, none of us are compatible. <laughs> none of us are. There's not one special person who if you find that one person, then you will have a trouble-free life in all areas of your marriage, including sex. We are all weak people. We're all people who at times are very difficult to live with generally, and even in terms of our sex lives can be very, very selfish. And this is a huge, huge thing is that when we talk about, and the world talks about, a, a, compa- a, um, a, a compatibility thing, when you really unpack what they're saying there, is really, is am I getting the best deal? You know, just as I, would, I want to get the best deal when I'm buying a car or a house or whatever, when it comes to sex, it's the same kind of thing. And what we have to understand here is that we can unconsciously, if you're a Christian even here today and you're married, we can carry that selfish view of sex into our marriage as well. We can actually secretly think it's still about what the pleasure that I get, rather than realizing that actually, of course, in God's grace, there is great pleasure within it, but actually, like all areas of marriage, we are called to serve each other. It's amazing, in Ephesians 5, it says this. You might wanna turn there if you've got a Bible. Ephesians chapter five, talking about marriage. It says in verse 25, this is just to husbands. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He's saying a radical thing to husbands. How did Jesus love the church? He sacrificially served her by giving his life, giving his life at the cross so that the sin of all those people could be put on him and he could take the judgment. He served each one of us here today. And this is the amazing thing about marriage and indeed, therefore, about sex as well, is that marriage is meant to be a signpost to the world out there, indicating something of the incredible relationship that God desires to have with every single person in this world. This is a quote from PJ Smythe. He says, he says, God invented marriage to act as an advert, a visual aid, a kind of mirror to reflect and reveal something of the marriage-like relationship that he desires to have with every person. He goes on, he says, when I was 18, I had some good friends called Pete and Caroline, and they just got married, and I envied their amazing relationship. I was chatting this through with an older pastor. I said, they're so lucky, they can be together 24 seven, and they're the best of friends. John replied, yes, marriage is amazing, isn't it? But it's not as amazing as the relationship that you and Jesus have. He is not only with you 24-7, but he is the perfect partner and friend, loving you unconditionally forever. I'm now 34 and remember this conversation like it was yesterday, because a good marriage had taught me something about Jesus' love for me. What an amazing advert marriage can be for Christianity. He says there's one final thing. He says, now please put on your fake horns and pretend that you are the devil. You exist to prevent people from becoming Christians. So this marriage business is a major problem for you. You want to do something in your power, everything in your power, to mess up the advertising campaign of the opposition. So you try to turn it around so marriage is actually a bad advert for a relationship with God rather than a good one. Why are so many marriages, why do so many marriages go through such difficult times? I think one of the key things is that Christians, we have an enemy that is a real enemy who works hard at trying to make marriages break up. 
God loves marriage. He loves sex, which lies at the heart of marriage. And we have an enemy who will try every means possible to get in there. Why? Because it's a God-ordained way, marriage, of reflecting something. The love that the, t- that the man and woman that I have for each other is going to be a picture of the love that Jesus and his church have for one another. So when we therefore come back to the original question of, being, of, of the world saying, well, marriage and sex is crazy because what about finding someone who's sexually compatible? Actually, as Christians, we say, no, no, no. You have to understand this in the big picture of what marriage and therefore sex is actually about. It's meant to be a picture, a mission picture to communicate something of the incredible relationship and love that our God has for his people. It's amazing. It's amazing. When you understand sex as part of that, suddenly we realize that actually it's an amazing mission opportunity to communicate the love of God for us. There's one final thing I think we tend to hear, I think, if we're Christians, that the world will tend to say about sex and marriage and why the two, you know, will be this, is that it's unrealistic, it's naive to think that being with one person for the rest of your life could ever be sexually satisfying. Surely, surely sex within marriage just gets boring. You know, surely you have to have multiple partners over your whole life in order for it to be something that remains exciting. This is a a very, very common view. It's interesting, statistically, in The Guardian, they did a survey and they said, and they found that 86% of married people were sexually satisfied whereas 70% of singles weren't. Those singles obviously would have been those who were free to have as many sexual partners as they wanted. So even the raw statistics don't actually back up what many in the world would believe. But we as a people, and this is our final point today, we have to be a people who are thoroughly convinced that God's passion, if you're a married person, is that your sex life, quite simply, would get better and better and better and better. Even though the world out there might think, oh, that's crazy and naive. Actually, I know that we might think, well, that's a bit weird to think about. But actually, God wants to bless the marriages in this church so that with confidence we can talk about that to those who don't know Jesus and actually prove that God is so amazingly able to do that. I was at a dinner party recently with some people, some Christian friends. And everyone was just looning around and it was all fine and one of the couples who was a bit older than us, we ended up talking about sex somehow. And suddenly, the woman looked at her husband across the table in front of everyone and just said, and she was talking to us, but she just said, and I just want to testify that sex gets better and better and better. <laughs> and we were like, okie dokie. <laughs> dessert, should we have some dessert? Should we have some coffee? It was a bit weird, but I have to say, fantastic. Fantastic, that's true. And fantastic that she felt comfortable to talk about it. It's a little from left field, but you know, actually, the reality is, praise God. One last scripture to look at. Let's look at so- the Song of Solomons. Chapter 7. Turn it on your Bibles. It's right in the middle. A Song of Songs was written by a guy called Solomon when he was a pretty young man. And when you read this book, scholars disagree whether it's about Solomon and one of his wives, or whether it's about a shepherd and a shepherdess, and whether at which point in the scripture they get married and all that stuff. I think the reality is we don't really know. But what this is telling us in a broad sense is this, and it's a wonderful toolkit for any of you who are married, is it's, it's, it's showing us that sex and romance are at the heart of who God is. God is someone who's made it. He's someone God who, who delights in it, and he wants to help us to become better lovers. Hallelujah. We see in chapter 1, for example, we, we see the whole thing of kissing. It says in verse 2, it says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Hallelujah. We see then in chapter 2, the whole issue of touching and that stimulation. And then in chapter 4, more along those lines. And then we get to chapter 7, and things really start to get a bit steamy. This is in the Bible. It says this, it says, this is the guy speaking. Guys who are married, take note. I love this. How beautiful are your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. You have wonderful feet. Your graceful legs are like jewels. 
that the work of a craftsman's hands. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Your breasts, I said the B word, your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are like the pools of Heshbon. And your nose, your nose, your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. <laughs> Interesting. Try that one, guys, tonight. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, my love. <laughs> All scripture is God-breathed. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like a royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its, by its tresses. How beautiful you are. How pleasing, O oh love, with your delights. Your statute, I love this, your statute is like that of the palm and your breasts are like clusters of fruit. Of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruit. My goodness. And we're out of time. No, no, we keep going. May your breasts be like the clusters of the vine, the fragrance of your breath, like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. May the wine go straight to my lover. And he says, I belong to my lover. This is the woman speaking now. His desire is for me. Come, my lover, let us go to the countryside. Oh my goodness, we must stop there. <laughs> it goes on and on. It's, this is God's words. It's amazing. God isn't prudish. In the context of marriage, God loves sex. He loves to see his children growing in this way. The biggest enemy, I think, is dullness and conservatism. And I think we see here a wonderful license for the man and the woman to take initiative and to, and to be creative and to put energy into thinking about it. And there we go, you know. I love it. In 1 Corinthians 7, the Apostle Paul puts it like this. Slightly more formally, he says, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. And likewise, he was single, by the way, we think. Likewise, the wife to her husband, the, the wife's body, the body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. So do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Okay, so there's one reason why. Prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So what he's saying here is this, is when you get married, your body no longer is just your body. Actually, Josie, you're so lucky. This is your body now. <laughs> your body is mine. <laughs> so if Josie has a headache, we have a headache. We are now one flesh. We share that, that same thing. So God is saying here, I believe to us, is that actually he wants to... He wants to loosen us, I believe. Now, don't mishear me. I know perhaps if you're not married here today, you might be thinking, that's great, Tom. Thanks for that. But listen, for those who are married, that actually God wants us to be a people who have a full understanding of what Scripture says. And that we can be confident, I believe, as we engage with those who have a different perspective on life to us, that yes, as, as the church at large, we have at times been prudish and judgmental. We've also at times been a people who have, who have lacked sharing the common ground of celebration that actually sex is God's gift. But I do believe that also we need to be really clear that actually marriage is the only safe place. And that actually it's not naive to think that you can have a sex life throughout your marriage that gets better and better. God's word compels us to conclude that as long as husbands and wives were looking to serve one another, Endeavouring to understand that we are different, very different, and therefore we need to serve each other in terms of understanding that. Nevertheless, God's passion is that actually his church would have marriages that are wonderful places to be. Let's pray. Father, Father, we love you so much. We thank you, God, that you are not a God who is prudish. You are not a God, Lord, who shrinks back from helping us to understand the whole breadth, Lord God, of what it is to be someone who loves you, who lives according to your statutes, someone who lives in obedience to your perfect word. Lord, I just want to even today, right now, as I look out on this army before me and on this wonderful family, Lord, I pray today 
for all those here who are married. I pray God, whether they've been married 50 years or five weeks, I pray today, Lord God, that you would help all of us who are married to have a biblical understanding. God, that we would not be selfish, we would look to be selfless. Lord, we would be look to be a people who are all the time, Lord God, realizing that this is actually a spiritual thing, that there is a spiritual dimension to this. We have an enemy who wants to bring down marriages. I pray even now for, for marriages. If you're married here, just pop, can you just put your hands in the air? I just want to pray for you now, even now. I just pray now for every marriage in this place. I pray, Lord God, that even now you would just free these guys to have wonderful fun together. I pray for romance, romance to come, Lord, all over these people. I pray they would just be a people who more and more, Lord God, even if they've been married for a long period of time, it'd be like that first day that their eyes met. Lord, I pray, I prophesy over this church, keep our marriages strong, Lord. Lord, we do have an enemy. And and Lord, we have an enemy who is not stupid. He understands that if he can, if he can attack the area of sex, he will attack the, 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 the marriage itself and families. And I just pray now, Lord God, Lord, would you help us to be a people who grow, Lord God, in terms of understanding all that you'd have for us. Lord God, I pray, bless these marriages in Jesus' name. Jesus' mighty name, amen.